Hey, if you're joining us online, I want to say a special welcome to you this morning. I am, I am excited about what God has for us today. I'm excited about what God has for you today and what he wants to say and what he wants to do. And uh, so with that being said, if you are a guest with us, you pick the perfect time to be here. Because as a church, what we're doing in this new calendar year, we've just kind of reset and launched into this new year with a new initiative that is just really basically based on prayer. We're saying, hey, what we're wanting to do as a church is we don't want to like attach prayers as a postscript to our faith. We want to lead and live out of our faith, and we want to be a praying people. And so last week, what we did is we launched into this brand new year, and we just basically said, hey, uh, this is where we believe God's calling us. We want to be a church that uh, has 50,000 Jesus conversations a year. Why? Because that's what Jesus did. I don't know that he had 50,000. He probably blew that out of the water, you know what I mean? But that's what he did. Everywhere he went, every person he, w- he met was an opportunity. Every road he went down, every marketplace, every synagogue was an opportunity to talk about the kingdom of heaven and how it was available for all people. We said, hey, we want to do that. As a church, we want to be that, and we're going to commit this thing to praying. All to say, we launched into 21 days of prayer and fasting, and we're seven days in. And if you think that, man, I, what I gave up is big and I'm dying right now, I had that thought this week too. Hang in there, man. It is worth the sacrifice. You are trading something. You're giving something up for something better, and that's why we pray, and that's why we fast. Well, these Jesus conversations that we talk about, we're like sharing Jesus. Man, sometimes Jesus would care for somebody, and sometimes he would share, whether it was in a synagogue or at a well, and other times he just prayed. I saw this awesome Jesus conversation take place this past week in a Chick-fil-A. Now, we should all be praying that Chick-fil-A comes to Casper, Wyoming. That would be awesome. Chick-fil-A sauce. Mmm, my mouth waters just thinking about that. But okay, Chick-fil-A, here's what happens, you guys. This past week, uh, they're, they're taking orders. There's probably like 30 to 40 cars in the drive through at Chick-fil-A. Why do I say that? Because there's normally 30 to 40 cars lined up in a Chick-fil-A drive through if you've ever been one. And there's people in the store and in the restaurant, and all of a sudden, somebody steps up to the register, and they go to order that number one, and the manager just says stop. Can we just hold on a minute? Rather than me tell you what the manager did, let me just show you what the manager did. Check this out. Uh, we have one of our team members that is starting surgery right now uh, for breast cancer, and we'd like to say a short prayer for her if you would like to join us. Uh, it's Miss Trish, so if you all know her out in our dining room. Uh, today's a rough day for us, so we're hoping that things go well. And so this will just take a second. We're going to try to do this as fast as we can. So if you bow your heads, and I'm not great at this, but I'm going to do my best. Uh, dear Lord, uh, please just protect Ms. Trish as she begins her surgery today. Please give the surgeon a steady hand as they uh, perform the needed surgery on her. And please keep everybody in the, in the surgery room. Uh, let them be at their best today. We have sharp minds and clear heads as they work on her. Uh, we need her back here. Uh, she is our light. She is a uh, pillar in the community for us. And everybody here loves her so much. And please, please just protect her and get her back here uh, to brighten our days, all of our days, as soon as you can. Uh, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs> that is awesome! The dude was like, I'm not very good at this. Translated, I've never done this before. Hey, this doesn't happen normal. And he just had a Jesus conversation for somebody he loves, and people prayed. If you're taking notes this morning, I want you to write this, because today, here's what we're going to do, man. We're going to just ask Jesus to teach us to pray. But the first blank on your outline says this, Jesus' conversation bathed in prayer equals life change. There is no way, there is no way that you can tell me that that didn't have an impact on people's lives. This is, in the Jesus conversations that we're having, our job is to plant, our job is to water, it's God's job to make it grow. You cannot tell me that people's lives weren't changed that day. That guy loved the employee, that guy loved the co-worker, and because he loved her, 
He just prayed. There were people in that restaurant that day, I guarantee you, who were terrified of what it looked like to pray. And Jesus, man, when that guy prayed, God used that prayer to make them bolder. Man, there was, Jesus, God used that prayer that day. When that man prayed, God used that prayer to say, wow, for, in somebody else's life, there's power in prayer. When I watched that video, I was like, you know what? People are willing to pray. People want to be prayed for. Four. Like, here's what I walked away. That dude believed in the power of prayer. And here's what I want to tell you this morning. I believe in the power of prayer. Like, I want to believe in the power of prayer that when we pray for something in Jesus' name, that God hears. And so I'm hoping today that as we pray that the Holy Spirit would do a new work in us. Because the goal of this series is that we would become a people who believe in the power of prayer and that our prayer prayers would escalate, that that faith in those prayers, in the God who hears them, that that faith would deepen and that it would grow. This past week in our community groups, now if you're not in a community group, you still have time to get into one. Uh, I loved uh, this past week's video in our community group. We got to meet the author of Circle Maker. Uh, His name is Mark Batterson. And uh, if you saw the video, this will be a quick repeat for you. If you didn't see it, you should get in a group so you can because it was awesome. He's a lead pastor. He's the guy who wrote the book Circle Maker. And he was talking about National Community Church. And he was saying, man, when we first started, it was easier for, to keep my, it was easier for me to keep my eyes closed because it was just too painful to open them. He goes, I looked out and it was just, we're just so small. But his faith in God was bigger. And he goes on to tell the story of how he went for a walk around Capitol Hill. But he didn't just go for a walk that day. It was a prayer walk. And he did this circle around Capitol Hill. And he highlighted that area. And he said, God, this is your ground. And the people who live on it are your people. Help our church make a difference in your kingdom in within this circle and beyond. And God has been answering that prayer over and over and over and over again for the past decade and a half. Oh, that you and I, you and me, would pray prayers, that we would highlight things that relate to the heart of God, and that he would answer those type of prayers, that our prayer life would birth dreams that we would chase, that would honor God, that would be bigger than what we are, that he could answer over and over and over again. I believe we can pray prayers like that, that are bigger than, Lord, just give me a good day. Lord, be with me today. You don't need to ever pray that prayer. I'm not saying you can't. I'm just saying you don't need, he is already with you. He will never be more with you than he is right now because he lives inside of you. So we just start from that place. But praying is a big deal. If you go back to the ministry of Jesus Christ, what did Jesus do over and over and over again? He prayed. Prayer, to make it as simple as I can, the next blank on your outline Prayer is communicating with God. Jesus would get away before Jesus ever called a disciple, before he ever picked a disciple, before he ever performed a miracle, before he ever gave a sermon, Jesus prayed. He talked with the Father. He talked with God. He communicated with God. He told him what was going on, and he heard from God what God wanted. Jesus was communicating with God. In fact, here's what I would tell you. If you look back through Jesus' ministries, I bet there are people who have been following Jesus for a while who have got your favorite Jesus story. If you look at some of your favorite moments of Jesus' ministry, you will find a prayer attached to it. Let me tell you one of my favorite Jesus stories is where Jesus fed the 5,000. Jesus is there, he's on this little hillside, and he's preaching to the masses, and the disciples come to him about evening, and they're like, hey, Jesus, you should send these people away, because they're starting to get hangry. So Jesus says, no, they're going to stay here, you feed them. And they start looking at one another like, dude, you got, you got Chick-fil-A tucked in that tunic? You know, they're wondering, and they all look at each other like, I got nothing, I got nothing. Yeah, but the boss just said, we got to feed them. And so they go out, and they come back, and they're like, hey, I got five loaves and two fish. And you know what Jesus says? He doesn't say, go back and get more. He says, hey, thanks. That'll, That'll do. And then what did Jesus do next? He prayed. And he fed over 5,000 people. 
not just spiritually, but he fed them with food. You see, there's some of you here today who you think, you, I don't have much to offer God. There's not much God could use. If all you have is a desire for God to use you, you know what Jesus says? That'll do. Let's pray over that. God, here's my servant. They just want to be used by you. God can use that. You may think you're not bringing much to the table. Guess what? You don't have to. You're coming in prayer, giving to the Father. God can use you. Let me tell you about the most powerful miracle ever performed in human history. Jesus Christ, God in flesh, goes to the cross. And as he's hanging on the cross and his life is, he's bleeding out and life is fading away second by second for our sins, what do we find Jesus doing? Jesus prayed while he was on that cross for you and me and for the people there. The next time you find yourself suffering or hurting and somebody hurt you, one of the most powerful things you can do in that moment is pray. And you might be thinking, okay, well, that's when Jesus prays. Cool. Let me tell you about this other moment, man, in the history of the church. Jesus has told his followers, he had told his people, he told church, he's like, hey, I want you to stay in Jerusalem and you wait for the Holy Spirit to come upon you. They didn't have to wait minutes, they didn't have to wait hours. They had to wait weeks. But because Jesus said do it, they did it and they waited and they gathered in the upper room and they began to pray. And when they began to pray, the Spirit of God came upon them and in different languages they began to speak the good news of Jesus Christ that created such a stir that people from different nationalities Different languages heard and understood, and Peter stands up, and he begins to proclaim the good news, and 3,000 people were added to their number that morning. That's people like you and me meeting, seeking God, praying, praying in the will of God, and look at what happened. It would appear to me that when people pray, to the Lord God Almighty, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and they pray the heart of God, it would seem that God hears, God answers, and God moves. Now, when I talk about prayer, I know that there are some people here, you are excited. You're like, come on, bring it, bring the hurt, come on. And I'm like, yeah. But I also know, because I've been there myself, that not everybody feels that way this morning. There may be some people here today who are cynical about prayer. You're like, yeah, that happened back then, but I haven't seen that happen in my life. Or maybe there are some people here this morning that you're scared to pray. You're scared to pray for two reasons, because what you want to pray about is really important to you. And if you were to pray about it and God wouldn't answer your prayers in the way that you thought or the time that you thought he should, you feel like, man, I'd just be disappointed, so I'm not going to pray. Or maybe you're not praying because you're scared. You're worried that the words won't come out right. That what you're going to say isn't going to sound pretty or flow naturally. It's never about the words. It's not a magic formula with the words. It's always about the one that we're talking to. I know that there's some this morning you don't want to pray because you're tired. You've been praying, you've been praying, and God isn't answering in the time that you think he should. And you're just tired and you don't want to. For some of you, you would say, I'm angry at God. I'm mad at him. Life isn't fair. Why is this happening to me? I'm done. You wonder why you're even here. Let me tell you something. God's not put off by your, by your, he's not put off by your anger. He's not put off by your doubt. He's not put off by your cynicism. Here's what he is. Deeply, madly, affectionately in love with you. He's a good father who's just going to be patient and patiently love you through it 
And if I could just tell you this, don't give up. If that's how you feel, don't give up. Don't give in. There is one who right now, while you can't see the outcome, he is working things for your good and for his glory. Hang in there. That's you. Hang in there. Because we're all coming at prayer from a different heartbeat today, from a different mindset today, from a different understanding today, we're just going to go back to the beginning. Turn with me to Luke chapter 11, would you? Turn with me to Luke chapter 11, and let's look at this. What is going on? Luke chapter 11, if you want to know where Luke's address is, Matthew, Mark, Luke in the New Testament. Luke chapter 11. Here we go. One day Jesus was? One day he was praying. Now listen, man, some of you are thinking, I'm too busy to pray. Could you possibly, is that the conversation you want to have with God? I'm just too busy for this. Could anybody had more pressure on him than Jesus? Could anybody's calendar been more booked than his? Could the demand be any harder, harsher, higher on anybody else? Listen, you, don't, you do not want to compare your circumstances, your calendar, your deadlines to what his was. And yet he always found time to. And here he is in Luke chapter 11 praying. Wow. He's praying. And when he finished... One of his disciples came up to him and said, Lord, will you teach me to do miracles like you? Wait, sorry. I don't think it says that. Let me try again. When Jesus had finished praying, one of his disciples came up to him and said, Lord, that sermon you gave two hours ago was awesome. Will you, will you teach me the basics, the nuts and bolts of how to preach? No, so you guys are looking at me funny. It doesn't say that, does that? These disciples could have asked absolutely anything. They've been doing life with him. They've seen his ministry. They're, they're, they are with him 24-7. And the thing that this one disciple out of all the other disciples asked is, Lord, will you teach me to pray? These guys have been praying their entire lives. It's not like they didn't know how to pray, but when they're looking at Jesus, They've heard rabbis preach. They've heard Pharisees pray. Rabbis pray. Pharisees pray. Sadducees pray. All these religious people pray. They pray. They've seen their moms, dads, their grandmas, and grandpas. And then they see Jesus pray, and there's something different. And one of them says, Lord, would you teach me to pray? I want to just talk about two things real quick because there's something powerful here. The first one is, Lord, I pray I'd be like that one disciple. There's 12 of them. And one of them thirsted and hungered for what Jesus had when it came to that prayer. Man, you know what, you guys? That our church, that you, that me would thirst and hunger for prayer like that. That we would pray prayers like Jesus. That God would use us like Jesus. Listen, that we would thirst and hunger for that. That man was thirsty for that. That man was hungry to be used. That guy wanted more of God. And so he went on everybody else's behalf. And he says, Lord, teach us. Don't just teach me. Would you, would you just teach all of us? And that's been my prayer this week. Lord, teach Highland Park Community Church. Teach Mike Fackler how to pray. I love the fact that he thirsted and hungered for it. And that that thirst, that God would create that thirst. And that he would create that hunger inside of you and me to pray like Jesus. But here's the second thing. This thought has been coming back to me all week long, and I, I mostly landed on the fact that it was for me. But I think it's for some of us in here today. Because when I say prayer, it's like ho-hum, humdrum, I got it figured out. That is a dangerous spot to be in, my friends. And that's pride talking. And the older I get, the more I see pride in my life. If your life, if your prayer life isn't like Jesus, if fruit isn't falling out of your life like it did for Jesus, like it did when Jesus, God's got more work to do. And just in case you think you're there, you're not. And neither am I. Lord, teach me to pray like you.
and forgive me for my pride where I think I got it figured out. So Jesus says, okay. So he gathers the guys. He says, all right, so when you pray, here's what I want you to pray. Father, now for you and I, for you and me, we've had this for 2,000 some years. Like, we get it. Like, we get the Lord's Prayer. So we had grown up reciting the Lord's Prayer. You're like, Father, okay, I get it. This is the first time these men have ever heard that. They've been praying their entire lives. Yahweh, El Shaddai, the great I am. Some of them are, because God's name is so holy, would not even dare utter his name. Jesus says, when you pray, Start with Father. This is a completely brand new concept to them. And so today, I know that this concept has been around for us for a while because of where we're at in history, but I'm praying that the Spirit of God would make it new for you today because when Jesus says, start with Father, he is attaching something that they know to God. Knowledge and information in relationship with a Father. You see, in Jewish customs, a father was to be revered, a father was to be, to res- was to be respected, he had influence, and he had authority. Now, there's many Sundays where I'm like, ladies, you can reach over and nudge, nudge the guy next to you. Or I'll say, guys, you can reach over and you can nudge your wife. Today, dads, here's the deal. When the father spoke, the children obeyed. Let me say it again. When the father spoke... In that custom, there was no maybes, if, ands. It got done. Here's where you can lean over and nudge your kids right now. Say, hey, listen to what he's saying. Because that was the custom. And Jesus is attaching something that they know. And they've got this picture. And they've got these feelings associated with the Father. Now, that was their tradition. Let me give you the most important thing. A father. Dude, a father loves his kids. A father loves to be around his kids. I got two kids. And one of the greatest joys in my life is my kids wanting to be around me, wanting to spend time with me. I love my kids. I'll sacrifice for my kids. I want to play with my kids. A father loves his children. And he's telling the disciples, when you pray, let's relate to the let's relate to God as a child relates to a father. There's a relationship there. See, a father knows his kids. One of the craziest things my kids ever tell me is like, Dad, I love you more than you love me. I was like, absolutely impossible. You see, every day that kid wakes up, those kids wake up, there is nothing they could do to make make me love them anymore. And there is nothing that they could ever do to make me love them any less. And that is how a father loves. And you need to understand something. When you woke up this morning, there is nothing you could do to make your father, your heavenly father, love you any more or any less. He absolutely loves you. And when you pray, like you might say, you know, hey, I didn't have a good father. My earthly father wasn't good. Or maybe you didn't even know. You have a father, a heavenly father, who was there, who knit you together in your mother's womb. He knows the number of hairs on your head, the personality that you have, the number of heartbeats that go on in your chest per minute. He is aware of all of them. The things that make you giggle make him giggle, man. It laughs. The things that hurt your heart hurts his heart. Jesus is saying, hey, when you pray, you start with Father. We can relate to him as a father. There's a relationship there. Well, how does a child relate to a father? Have you ever seen a little kid see their dad after dad's been gone for a couple hours? There is joy on that kid's face, and the kid screams out, Daddy! 
And they run and they scream and there's joy. And what the kid does is he runs to the, or she runs and he grabs dad. Some of you fathers, man, you get home. That's what it's like when you come home. Or like what you wish it was when you came home. That's what it is to be able to run to God. And not only is there joy on the kid's face, this afternoon, get on your phone. Your kids, your grandkids, when you're holding them, you know what you're going to see on your face? A smile. When you run to God, when you come to God in prayer, when we relate as a child, the father is always happy to see his kids. As a father, two boys. I'm broken, they're broken. One of the things that just so hard on dad, on me, is when my kids and when my relationship with my kids isn't in sync because of the way that they behaved. One of the things is, as a loving father, when our relationship with God the Father is out of sync because of the sin that exists in our life, the thing I yearn for most is that relationship to be made right. And what I would tell you is if that there is sin in your life this morning, that you are sinning intentionally and on purpose, all you have to do is stop and turn back to him because your heavenly father wants that relationship to be right. And where the enemy would try to cause guilt, fear, shame, division, the father's saying, no, you can come to me, man. I can't wait for my kids to come back to me and say, dad, can we talk about this? Dad, I'm sorry. I am game on for that. I'm like, yes, and we're hugging and I'm smiling because we're back in sync together. And this morning, maybe the greatest thing that you could do today is to get back in sync. And you're thinking, I don't know if I can or if I should or I don't know if I dare. I'm telling you, the father, he's just waiting for you. Because how does a child relate to a father? A child can relate to a father confidently that the father always wants to hear from them. Listen, I'm not a perfect father by any stretch. But the thing I try to tell my boys is there's nothing you can't tell me and I always want to be with you. And what God wants to tell us, what Jesus is telling us here in Luke chapter 11, is that you and me, we get to approach the Father confidently. But there's another way that children uh, approach the Father, is a child expects or approaches the Father expectantly. Anytime a father's got a, or a kid's got a need or needs something, what does a kid do? Dad! Dad, I got an eight-year-old in my house who thinks there is nothing I can't do. And thank God for Jesus and duct tape because I have proved him right so far. And a few Lego instructions. But here's what Jesus is telling us. As a child relates to his father, a child comes expectantly believing there is nothing their father can't do. And Jesus is saying, you're right. When it comes to you, there are some things that you cannot do. There are some things that, are, that you are limited in. But nothing is impossible for the father. Meaning, you can come if you need me to say, Daddy, Father. And if you're holding something that looks absolutely impossible, God is in the business of making the impossible possible. So when you pray, you start with Father. The goal of prayer, the beauty is, is as his kids, man, as his kid, we get to bring everything we want to the Father. Anything and everything, we get to do that. But the goal of prayer is never to get our prayer answered in the way that we think God should answer in the time that we should answer. The goal of prayer is to know the Father. You want to know why that one disciple said, Lord, teach us to pray? Because you want to know the Father like Jesus knew the Father. He was praying, but the relationship, while it was cool, Jesus just had something better, and he wanted that. And so the next blank on your outline says, Lord, teach me to pray so that I can know you. Next time you pray, we're not just going seeking God for something. We get to do that, that we would know the Father the way Jesus does. We can come to come to him confidently and we could come to him expectantly man when that one disciple went he observed he watched Jesus pray and every time Jesus prayed man life happened for people this disciple wanted a 
wanted an effective faith like that. He wanted a faith like Jesus. He wanted belief like Jesus. He's like, man, God, I, Jesus, I see God using you. Like, I see you pray. And when you pray, things change for the better. Not only in our lives, but in the lives of everybody you're talking to. And he says, I want in on that. Teach me to pray so that God can use me. That we would pray, Lord, teach me to pray so that you can use me. So Jesus says, all right, let me just teach you three words. You started with Father. The next three words are this. Your kingdom come. Oh, oh God, that your kingdom would come. Lord, in my anger, may your kingdom come. In my doubt, Lord, may your kingdom come. In my fear, Lord, your kingdom come in my life. In my disbelief, Lord, your kingdom come. In the dark corners that exist in my heart my mind, Lord, your kingdom come. You see, when Jesus would pray, he would say, Father. And then he would pray, your kingdom come. Because you see, as a kid, as a child relates to the father, it's the child's job to be about the father's work. And Jesus wanted to be about his father's work. And so when the disciple says, Lord, teach me to pray, he says, start with father, and then let's be about the father's work. Let's pray. Your kingdom come, God. When Jesus would get away, when you read that he would get away on a mountainside, or that he would get away from the crowds and he would pray. He was just hanging out with his dad, his heavenly father, spending time with them. Both of them thoroughly enjoying the moment. Like we read Jesus prayed all night and we think that that is so far out of reach for us. But man, that relationship was so good, man. It was, I promise you, it was just never enough time for Jesus. He probably always left that wanting more. It's so re-energized and refueled from spending time with the father. But as he prayed, and as he talked about his father's will, they would have been talking about people. And Jesus would pray for people before he ever saw them. He knew he'd see people with hurts, and he'd pray, Lord, I pray that your kingdom would come into their hurts and that they would experience healing. Lord, I pray for the habits that are enslaving these people. Your kingdom come that they might know freedom in you. There was people that he knew that were void of love, that were walking around depleted of love, and he was praying, Lord, your kingdom come. He knew that he was going to be talking to people holding on to idols, thinking it was the greatest thing that they would ever possess, and he was saying for them, Lord, your kingdom come. And then he did something. He brought in the kingdom of God. He brought the kingdom to those people. And newsflash, your job, your job description as a follower of Jesus Christ is to share and bring the kingdom of God to people that need to know him most, which is why we're chasing 50,000 Jesus conversations. He didn't just say, Lord, I pray for so-and-so today that your kingdom would come. Cool, did my job. Let's go get a, let's go get, you know, a falafel. What did he do after he prayed? He went and ushered in the kingdom of God. That is a role in teach me to pray. Teach me to pray your kingdom come is an all-in prayer. It is not a prayer of the sidelines. It is not a passive prayer. It is a prayer that says, God, teach me to pray so that you can use my life because you have things you want to do. And here's what I want you to know. God has plans for your life. When you pray for his kingdom to come, then it is our job to do everything within our, within our power to bring his kingdom. And we leave the rest up to God, the heavy lifting. Our job is to just plant seeds, water seeds, but whose job is it to make it grow? God's. And Jesus taught these men how to pray, and they began to pray. And it didn't just change it didn't just change them in a moment. It changed the course of history because these men began to pray and they began to relate to God as Father and they began to pray the Father's will and the Father's business. And you and I are standing here today. You and I are gathering in Jesus' name 
today is a result of that prayer that started so long ago. And what I would tell you is, if you will have the chutzpah to pray that prayer, there will be people one day in the kingdom of heaven because you prayed that the kingdom would come in their lives. And we'll all celebrate together. Lord, teach me to pray when I don't feel like it. Lord, your kingdom come in all the places that are desperate for it and send us into those places. But he's sending us out among the wolves. It's easy to talk about this here, but we're going to need him to accomplish this. It's up to him, but it starts with a prayer. So today, here's what we're going to do. A lot of times people talk about prayer and then say, hey, let's pray, you go and do likewise. The church gets together several times a week, whether in community or in whether a gathering like this. And today, the best way we can close our time together is pray. When we started 21 days of prayer and fasting, when we started the circle maker, we were asked in our journals to draw a circle. And all that is, is highlighting it. The circle isn't the power, it's the one we're talking to. It's the one who has the power. But you were to draw a circle, so right now I'm going to ask you to draw a circle on your outline. Draw a circle on your outline, and whatever is burning on your heart and your mind that you want to bring to the Father, I want you to put that in the center of your circle. In just a second, I'm going to say these words. Father, your kingdom come in regards to, and when I get into regards to, I want you to say out loud what you just wrote in the circle. And we're going to pray together as a church. Father, your kingdom come in regards to, and then you'll say out loud what that is, and then together we'll say, in Jesus' name, amen. Now, the reason we're doing this is because some of you walked in here and you thought, I can't pray. Some of you thought, I don't know how to pray. Well, Jesus just taught us how to pray, so we're going to practice right now. And, to, for, and so the reason we're doing it out loud is because some of you think, I can't do it. We're going to do it to show you that you can. All right, you guys ready? You guys got your circle? Did you write in the middle what it is? Confident and clearly, there is no mumbling allowed here. And if you're worried about what somebody next to you is going to think, don't. Because there is not one perfect person in here. We're all broken. We're all imperfect people running after a perfect Heavenly Father who loves us. And guess what? The best part about our dads is they know that we're not perfect. Heavenly Father knows we're not perfect, man. We just bring our stuff. So, Father, in regards to the things that I wrote, Oh, dude, that was so weak. <laughs> you can go to your father that way. Father, in regards to, yeah. I totally screwed that up. Father, your kingdom come in regards to, in Jesus' name, amen. We just prayed together. We just prayed out loud. We just prayed God's kingdom come in that thing that matters most to you. Your heavenly father heard. Your heavenly father cared. I would expect something to happen. I believe God heard. I believe God hears. And I believe he will answer that prayer for his glory. Next week when we talk about prayer... There was, Jesus asked a man a question. It was a hard question. Next week, we're going to force ourselves to answer that same question that Jesus asked. Have a great week, everybody.